Okay, let's see. Okay, I think we're live. Hi, everyone. Hello, hello. So happy to be here. And I'm so excited to introduce my guest today. First of all, I want to say thank you to everyone that is either watching the replay or watching this live. This is my very first Facebook Live for ABA Insurance Agency, and I hope to bring you great content. I hope to entertain you, and I hope to educate you. So um, without further ado, I'd love to introduce you, Nima, who will uh, be joining me on the screen right now. Hey, Nima, welcome. Good afternoon, how are welcome you? Welcome to the broadcast. So, so I see you're wearing my favorite character on your shirt. Are you a Star Wars fan? I am, have been for uh, since I was a kid. I remember, uh, let's see, um, when I was a kid, I remember my family took me to see the, the uh, Empire Strikes Back. I was very young at that time, though. And I've seen every single one since then. Amazing. So are you watching The Mandalorian uh, on Hulu or is it Netflix? I don't even know. <laughs> I've, I've watched yeah. different episodes. It's on Disney Plus. But, oh, um, Disney Plus, that's what it yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. When it all came out, I, I pretty much watched it in like three days. So yeah, oh, wow. I, I, yeah, I saw it. It, it, it was really, <laughs> it was really fun. I, I liked it. I'm looking forward. To, uh, I know season two is supposed to be coming out, and, and like they had already started production on it. So I'm looking forward to that coming out. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna say a controversial statement that you know not everyone agrees with, but my favorite, <laughs> my favorite Star Wars movie is Rogue One, not Empire Strikes Back. Empire Strikes Back is a close number two. Wow. Why is that? Uh, while we, you know, while Rogue One leads into Episode um, Four, so we kind of know what happens afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, I think just the general, the the general story of Rogue One, how it kind of filled in some holes that people always had about like that one ventilator shaft that um, what's his name, Luke Skywalker shot and blew it blew up the Death Star. But it was the ending of the uh, it was the ending of Rogue One that really hooked it for me as mm -hmm. probably the best. The, the, the number one star again empire strikes back it's a very close number two but it's the ending that that tips it over for me so first of all i want to say hi to a few of our viewers our first commenter frank palumbo and second is bernie lumberg uh bernie says that your beard is intense <laughs> <laughs> i know you've been growing it out for a while I, uh so, it looks amazing i do want to address that real quick um beard I envy. I had I had a shoulder surgery in November of 2018, so I was going to grow the beard as my recovery beard because I, I had it on my right arm and on my hand, so I couldn't shave. Oh, okay. Um, I couldn't shave with my left hand. I kept I nicked my face a few times. I said I'll just let it go. So it was a, it was a pretty like serious surgery. It took me a while to recover from it, um, and I'm still doing my rehab and everything all this time later. Mm -hmm. I actually set my appointment to have my beard taken off. I said, you know what? I think I'm where I like it to be now, and uh, I'm done with it. I set my point, appointment, um, and then like the next day, I got a call from the place saying, uh, "We need to cancel your appointment because the state's on lockdown." So now it's gone from my surgery beard to my quarantine beard. So, you know, now, now that we're kind of we have a bunch of viewers on, I want let's get started with talking about now with the coronavirus kind of brought up um, of how you've been coping. What have you been doing at home and? Uh, yeah how you're helping other people that are working from home with their estate planning uh sure so um as far as as far as what i do so i do i do estate planning estate litigation and um you know my firm does estate planning estate litigation and elder law so we do we help the uh seniors that are going to be transitioning to some sort of long-term care um you know handle their finances and their assets so for my purposes a lot of my work is not really in front of other people Anyway, a lot of it's it's on the computer, right? People send us documents. We look at the documents. We do what we need to do. Um, so, the only real transition is just trying to keep a normal and healthy schedule. Because you know, I used to get up in the morning, take the dogs out, feed them, have breakfast, get ready. Um, you know, and then I would take the dogs out to play for a while, get them tired for the day, like you know, half hour or so, have them run around, give them some treats, head off to work. Um, now it's a bit different because, you know, I'm not sitting at my desk the whole time. I don't have to. So I've, I've actually found a, 
it's taken me a little time to get used to it, but I've actually found a nice balance of, um, of work and home, especially because the the dogs are literally right next to me. I gave them uh, I gave them some bones to chew on during this thing, um, you know, and, and and they're excessively big goofs. So you know, when when one wants attention, they will sit next to me until I pay attention to them. One of them will bark in my face until I give them attention. So um, it's been a little bit of a a little bit of a change that way because they're used to kind of handling themselves. But now that I'm home, mm -hmm. they're on me as often as possible to pay attention to them or or take them out or do something. So you know. It's it's been a nice transition. I actually work longer days now because I'll do work for like a like a span of time, go do something else that not work related, and then you know go play with the dogs for like instead of thirty minutes, it'll now be like an hour and a half because I have you know I'm home. Why not? The time blocking. You're doing a lot of time blocking, like a lot of us during yeah. quarantine. I. Uh, I once read something about like um, when when you're working in an office, a good healthy way to do it is like the 25-5 rule. Like do 25 minutes of solid work, put your phone away, put whatever else at the end of 25 minutes, have a timer go off, and then you get five minutes of, you know, go on your phone, text people, go on social media, whatever. Five minutes and cut it off. Mine's more like 45 minutes and then like an hour. 45 minutes of work and then take the dog out for an hour. So if anybody can empathize with that or your schedule is similar, let us know what your schedule is looking like. <laughs> either with your kids or your pets, trying to work from home and making it all work. So Sanima, if somebody at this point, I get a lot of requests for life insurance and yeah. I see a piece of the planning portion. Yeah. I'm trying to understand, okay, so now I am, I am an apart, I rent, so I don't have too many assets. Right, right. But what should I be doing and people like myself or even homeowners to protect my family besides buying life insurance? So, um, I, oh, I'm getting an echo. Um, one of the things I always tell people is when you're estate planning, it's not for the person doing the planning necessarily, it's for their loved ones and their family, it's for the people that you're being in your documents, it's for people that you care about. And the reason is because um, you're telling people where you would like your assets to go, right? When you pass away or when something happens, mm -hmm. but it's gotta be handled in the right way. And I'll, I'll tell you the, the biggest times that, it, it, families fight, it's a thing that happens, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes we fight and get over it and everyone loves each other, everybody fights, um, but some families fight more than others. And I'll have families come to me saying, oh, I don't want to do that. Oh, it's fine. Oh, we're never going to have that issue. And I tell people, I say, well, today you don't have that issue. But, you know, this person passes away and, you know, one of you gets the money, one of you doesn't. Are you really okay with that? Is that really going to work out for everybody? And sometimes the answer is yes. And sometimes the answer is I didn't think of that. So what are things that someone like you could consider? Well, let me take a step back and kind of give you uh, an idea of what, the basic estate documents are that we're talking about. So the main one everyone knows is the last will and testament, right? When I pass away, this is the person I want to handle the wishes of my will, my executor. Um, and these are the people that I would like to get my assets, my money, my, my car, my couch, my whatever. Um, those are your beneficiaries. Uh, so, you know, you want your you want certain people to get your assets when you pass away. You're going to name them in your will, your beneficiary. You know, and, and sometimes when people are married and have kids, it's everything goes to my spouse. But if my spouse predeceases me, mm -hmm. uh, then and I'm the and I'm the surviving spouse, then it'll go to my kids. Um, and then depending on their age, there may be restrictions on what they can and can't get. That's without going into too much detail about it. There's parameters that you can set so that you can give an 18 year old a lot of money. Um, so, but the, the main reason why even someone that doesn't have a lot may want to set up a will is because again, not for your purpose, the person setting up the will, but the per person to handle your estate. If you don't name someone, your executor, if you don't have a will and say, this is the person I want to handle it. The first thing that you have to do is someone has to now go to the surrogates court and file a petition with them to say, I would like to become effectively the executor. Without a will, it's called an administrator. The administrator of this person's estate. So they have to pay a fee to file this thing. They have to petition to the court to say, I should do it. 
Um, and then depending on who they are in relation to you, they may have to give notice to other people to say, if they have a claim to come forward, if they want to do it, they can contest that. Then whoever the administrator is, um, depending on how much in assets your estate has, depending on who the administrator is, to become administrator and start working in your estate, they may have to post a bond with the surrogate's court, some percent, some percentage of the value of your estate. You know, off the top of my head, maybe 20%, right? So if someone has a million dollar estate and there's no will, the administrator may have to get a bond for 20% of that to post to the surrogate's court. Um, so that's money out of their pocket, more money out of their pocket, more time being spent. Um, this all sounds so complicated and difficult to, to do for. It's, it's, I mean, the thing is, it's not that it's complicated. It's that I think sometimes people think about it the wrong way. Again, people yeah. think about it about this is what I want when I die. But I always try to tell people like, well, what we really want is to protect your loved ones. We don't want them to spend time fighting with each other. We don't want them to spend tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars litigating over things, right? So if you set things up properly in advance, while well, people fight anyway and anyone can sue for anything at any time, you want to try to limit that as much as possible. So if someone says, oh, this will is no good, it's up to that person to prove that the will is no good versus you to prove that the will is fine. So it makes it harder for someone to contest the will. Got um, it. Versus if someone has an email from you saying, hey, I want you to get my nice watch or something like that, and the administrator of the estate doesn't want to do that, that person is going to come in and sue for that watch maybe. And you know they're going to say, the wishes of this person was for me to get it. There can be issues that come out of that. So the whole point of estate planning, the main purpose of, of it, I think, is to protect your loved ones from you know themselves and each other and to protect their money because you know it, it, they may want to spend they may want to hire an attorney they may want to handle things and mm -hmm. those things can be expensive well how much money does your estate have to pay for an attorney how much you know how and if they use up all the money are they on the hook for it there's a lot of questions that go into that are so they just going to use up all the money i apologize abby yeah. has a great question how often should a will get updated um is there a certain time period that you recommend to your clients how often they should update their will? Um, well, the, sh the shortest answer I can give you is a good time to look at your will or any of your estate documents. The other, the other ones also are um, anytime something significant happens in your personal life. So some of those events that happen are if you get married, mm -hmm. you have children, um, you have grandchildren. Uh, what's what's a, a, another thing is um, you move to a different state. Oh. Different states may have different requirements for a will. So the will that we do in New Jersey, I don't know the different laws in different states all over, but you know, you move to Utah, Arizona, Colorado. They may have a different format that you need a will in. They may have things that you can't put in a will that New Jersey allows. Um, what do you realize? So you may want to take your will, take it to an estate attorney in Colorado and say, is this okay? Um, yeah, so, so some major life life events that happen. If someone named in your will, the executor, you know, some we tell people when you name an executor, have a backup in mind too, in case something happens to the first person. Um, but if something happens to a beneficiary, if something happens to an executor, if something happens to a trustee, someone you named to be guardian of your children in the event something happens, you pass away, when your kids are young, you may want to say, oh, well, this person is our named guardian and they passed away. We should find someone else to do it. So it's simple. there are simple things that can be done to tweak some of those things. Um, otherwise, without any of that, sometimes just having someone take a look at it every couple of years, you know, three, five, ten years, whenever you get around to it. Um, doesn't hurt us to say, is this still okay? Is there anything that we should consider? Because the laws change all the time too. Different court cases happen, different statutes mm -hmm. get passed. Um, and you know, significant to that point, outside of the will, there are a couple documents that we use for estate planning that take effect while you're alive. So those, those documents are your financial power of attorney and your, um, this one has a few different names, but your healthcare directive or your medical power of attorney I always get confused uh, about that. They're generally the same thing, you know, six one way, half dozen the other. It's effectively the financial power of attorney is who can make financial decisions for me in the event that I can. And then the medical power of attorney is who can make medical decisions for me in the event that I can. 
Um, and you can help with all those documents, correct? Absolutely. And, and those documents, I, I would say, you know, during the course of your life, those documents are probably the most important. Uh, and, and when we're talking about how, is corona, how does coronavirus affect that? Well, consider for a second that, you know, there are, there are a lot of seniors out there, right? And if people are living longer and longer these days. And those people right now are the higher risk category of coronavirus, right? They're, they're the people who are older, seniors, 70s, 80s, we don't want them going out and, and, and being uh, at risk. Mm -hmm. So what happens if someone needs to you know, handle things for them, their finances or whatever, because they can't leave the house to do it and they're not tech savvy? I'm sorry, cut out. No, 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 so I'm, I'm here. Oh, okay. Um, what happens in those circumstances? Well, if you have, if, if this senior, this person who can't leave their house right now, or someone with a medical condition that can't leave the house, has signed over a power of attorney to someone that can handle those things for them, then that person can go to the bank and write a, you know, write a check for them if they need to, or, or cash a check for them, or, do, or, or handle their finances for them based on mm -hmm. what the power of attorney allows them to do. Uh, so from that perspective, you can help your family members or whoever by having one of those things in place in the event that you can. Um, generally, the power of attorney uh, will work in the event, you know, for the purposes of my practice, especially the elder law per portion, um, when people are, are, are working with their parents and their parents are becoming older and, and you know, they fall into having Alzheimer's or dementia or anything like that, they really can't make financial decisions for themselves anymore. Sometimes shouldn't. And the power of attorney will allow their child or spouse or whoever they name to take care of those things. And when we when we look at want to look at their finances for the purposes of uh, long term care planning, if you know, the, if someone's child can go to the bank and say, I need all their financial statements for the past five years for my attorney. One, they can hire me as the attorney mm -hmm. because they have the power to do that. Two, they can go to the bank and the bank can give them those documents that they normally wouldn't be able to, to give. Whereas if this person just doesn't have the mental wherewithal to do these things themselves, they're stuck. They can't handle these things themselves, so what are they gonna do? Um, and then just to go back to what the financial power of attorney is helpful for, let's say you have a parent or a grandparent or a relative that has dementia or Alzheimer's and really can't take care of themselves anymore, and you don't have power of attorney over them, Mm -hmm. What you would have to do is you would have to file with the court for what's called guardianship. You would effectively have to ask the court permission to become this person's power of attorney. And that is a lengthy process, months to happen. It's not easy. It can be contested by people who may think that they're better suited for the job than you. And it's expensive. Um, so it sounds like bottom line is to start working with you. The sooner the better and uh, to plan for the unexpected. I just had a question for you. Uh, I, I know a lot of, I see a lot of professionals are watching this. Do you ever collaborate with any professionals? Um, how, how, do, how do they come into the state planning process? Sure, uh, so. Who do you work with normally? Yeah, I look, when we do estate planning, I always ask people, you know, uh, like a, a friend of mine, um, a very young guy, successful, uh, doesn't have any estate planning documents or anything put together. So I asked myself, well, what kind of documents, what, what kind of planning have you done for yourself in any, in any financial sense? Because while well, he has a business, um, he has some investment assets, that kind of thing. I said, okay, uh, you know, I don't do any sort of like financial planning or anything like that. That's not my business. So I said to him, I said, are you investing? Are you doing that kind of stuff? Where are your, where are your assets? Do you have insurance? Do you have these kinds of things? And, you know, um, Interestingly, he didn't have really anything set up. No life insurance, right? He's wow. on the, he's going to be getting. He's supposed to be getting married. I, I maybe the wedding will be pushed off because it was supposed to be coming up soon. Um, but no life insurance policy, um, no financial planning, nothing really set up. So I said, okay, you know, um, and I, I said to him, I said, look, you should look into life insurance. It might benefit you because that's money you're going to put into this life insurance uh, policy that down the road maybe you're, it will pay out to your family and uh, or whoever you want it to go to your name beneficiary but this is a thing that's going to be outside of your estate right whatever you put in your will life insurance is not gonna is not part of that uh, is not part of your will um 
it, it's a se- it's a separate kind of asset. Uh, and then I told him, I said, you know, when you get married, do you have, are you going to have a joint bank account and joint property ownership with your spouse? And he's and you know they, he didn't really think about that either. I said, okay, well, because when you have a joint bank account or you own a house as husband or wife in certain in a certain kind of format, they have what's called automatic right of survivorship. So that's in your will too. You can't. You know, for example, Stella, you and I can have a bank account together. You can put all the money that you have in there, and I can put zero dollars in there, and that money automatically goes to me if something happens to you because it's our joint bank account. We are okay. both own that bank account 100% individually and combined. You know, so you can take all the money out. I can take all the money out. There's, there's that kind of – so that's – but the other thing is, if I get in trouble with creditors or something like that, it, that bank account can become affected. They can go after it. They can do things. Um, Even if I'm not responsible for your credit issues. Right. Because the bank account is both of ours. Got it. So, <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, but that's the dangers of having joint accounts. That can happen. So, you know, there, we I, I talk to them about different kinds of accounts, that, that that type of thing. So when you talk about what other professionals do I typically work with, um, you know, financial planners are a big one because, you know, maybe this person will have their money in investments uh, and that could tie it up and there could be other types of accounts that they have. Uh, insurance, again, life insurance is, is a big one I tell people about. Um, long-term care insurance might become a might become a big thing, um, depending on who you speak to. A long-term care insurance covers you know nursing home care costs uh, at a certain point, um, but for my purposes of long-term care planning, that can buy us time when we look at look back periods and that kind of thing for uh, the long-term care planning portion. Um, accountants are a big one. Um, you know, there's an account uh, when people come to us specifically for things like probating a uh, probating a will. When you take the will to the surrogate's court and say this person passed away and I need to handle their estate, um, we look at that and say, look, there might be tax implications depending on how you're related to the person that passed away. Um, so you need to go talk to an accountant to see how that affects things. Um, there, whether you have tax liability or not, you may still need to file something with the state um, to say there is or isn't. So you need to talk with a you need to talk with a tax professional for that purpose. Uh, so those are those are different kinds of people I, I typically refer to and, and work with when, when we talk about estate planning. So it sounds like you really work with a lot of different industries and they could be a great referral source for you as well as for them if, mm-hmm. well, as you build a referral um, book. Exactly. That, you know, if anybody's watching in, in those industries and love to connect with Nima, either for your clients or for yourself, um, or for your business, uh, I posted his phone number and his website. I uh, feel free to reach out to him. He'd love to help you and connect and uh, give you feedback. Let me just just wanted to make sure that that's up there. So, Neva, one thing I you know we've been uh, in a our BNI group now together for a little over a year, and one thing I remember you talking about is being a professor at Seton Hall. Oh, uh, so that actually didn't end up coming to fruition. Um, I was talking with the finance department of um, uh, in Seton Hall. A friend of ours, the group Frank, uh, introduced me to someone he knows there um, to, to speak with them, and I did. And, and what they wanted me to do is they wanted me to come and talk about uh, estate planning for their finance, uh, you know, for their finance students, um, well, you know, so as, as a guest lecturer. And uh, we're still working to see if that's a thing that's going to be put together. But yeah, coming up, um, hopefully that, well, uh, given the current circumstances, we're not going to. So I'm saying, are you going <laughs> to potentially still do it in the fall? Because that's pretty prestigious. Um, Seton Hall is a great school. It is. That's where I went to law school. I went to law school at Seton Hall. Oh, OK. So you're, you're from New Jersey, right? Mm-hmm. I went, uh, I went to Rutgers, uh, born and raised in New Jersey, went to Rutgers University, Seton Hall Law School. Um, although I did have a stint out in California where I got my master's out there. So I just wanted to say, first of all, before I forget, thank you to your dad. He's a frontline, frontline, uh, healthcare worker and yeah. doing amazing work to help people. I know that's, that's not part of the topic, but I really just want to give a thanks and a shout out to your dad. For yeah, yeah. 
really amazing work that he does. Um, you know, he's a he's a sleep specialist, and uh, he also does like pulmonary and, and critical care work. So he's, you know, he's kind of on the on the front lines of, of working with coronavirus patients in North Jersey. So, um, you know, given he's in his seventies himself, I worry about him doing those things. But he's you know he's a very smart guy, and they take care of him. So, you know, he's, yes, it's incredible. Yeah. So what what have have you um. For me personally, I started baking bread. Have you started a uh, quarantine hobby while you're? <laughs> um, you know, it, or just it, reading. <laughs> so I, I've been I've been doing a little bit more leisure reading lately, um, which is good. Uh, after the sour taste that um, the last few seasons of Game of Thrones left, I decided to um, get the books and. and oh man! <laughs> so you're the reading books. the books. Yeah, so I'm in. I'm on book two. I'm midway through book two right now, and um, you know it, that that's that's one of the things I've been doing. Also, um, you know the the two dogs I have. I I've always taken their training very seriously, but like some days I don't have the time. It's not a lot of time. I did we do it, but some days I don't have the time. I, I didn't have the time to take them out to go through their training and everything. So lately, every day I've been able to spend with like a half hour, or hour to go through the training process. Um, my my bigger dog is uh, is uh, I'm trying to get her certified for like trick training and therapy dog training. Oh, wow. and so she's a very she's a very sweet and smart dog. How old um, is she? They're both two. two. They're both they're both young. Yeah. Um, my, my my little one, she's um, she, she's she she pushes she pushes around right. She's <laughs> you know they're both they're both they're both good. They're both certified with the American Kennel Club for uh, their canine good citizen. Um, <laughs> obedience, obedience training. Um, oh, I actually have their uh, here. Yeah, I don't know Good citizen. Oh, amazing! <laughs> Congratulations. They, they both have one, um, but the the little one doesn't. You know, doesn't like to do the trick training as much or all the other stuff. The basics is kind of what she sticks to. My big one is is incredibly sweet and loves everything and just wants to relax and enjoy the day and be around people and whatever. Um, so, you know, I'm, uh, and she's very quick to pick things up. So I'm trying to get her to trick training and then after trick training, aim for like advanced obedience training, therapy dog training to take her around and, um, you know, like places that need therapy dogs. She'd be, she'd be a great resource for that. She's very good with small, you know, she's, it's funny, she's um, like 110 pounds. But if you put her in, yeah, but like she's been around like, three-year-olds four-year-olds and she's very gentle she's been around like five pound little those teacup dogs and she'll just stand over them and kind of look at them she'll lay on the ground next to them she's very very sweet very docile so i think she has a very good temperament for that so that's one of the things i've been doing is trying to get their training up that's awesome so if somebody were uh, wanted to learn more about estate planning or um, just general wills or even for their parents uh, what's uh, I, I put again the your phone number and your website on yeah. here what's yeah. the best way to contact you what information should they provide um if they were interested in working with you um the information that should be provided depends on what they're looking to do so that just to answer that question the, the short answer is it depends on what they know about the process and what they don't know so um for example, I have, a, I have a couple friends who haven't done any estate planning yet, and we spoke recently and they want to do it. I said, well, what do you know about it? What don't you know? They said, we don't know anything. I said, okay, well, how about we have a conversation about what this whole thing is? Kind of as I explained to you a little more detail, mm -hmm. what the different documents are, why they should get them. Um, and then depending on what they answer ba um, based on that conversation, it'll depend on what I need for them. We have a questionnaire that we typically hand out to clients that's like, you know, who would you like to be your executor, your backup executor, mm -hmm. guardians of your kids if they're still underage, if you both pass, if both parents pass away, a backup guardian. If there's going to be a trust or something set up, who do you want to be trustee and backup trustee? Um, who is your physician, you know, primary physician in the event that you can't make medical decisions, you need to contact mm -hmm. them. Those kinds of things. We give those to people to fill those things out um, so that we can put all that information into their documents. Uh, the best way to reach us, I mean, uh, people should start with a phone call because, you know, I, I, I always tell my clients this, um, whether it's in litigation or planning or whatever, um, you have to like your attorney to want to work with them. 
and you have to you have to sit down and with, with anybody if you want to work with anybody you should like the person you're working with right it's they should be you know they should be competent and good at what they do and you should want to work with them you know if if, so, if someone doesn't um if someone picks up the phone and doesn't you know they don't like the shirt right or they don't <laughs> like the gear whatever, that's their choice and they should go find someone that fits them you know best so i always say you know we should have a phone call we could get to know each other you should be comfortable with me to have me be looking at your financial documents your medical history i'm going to be looking at things that a lot of other people may not see um and it's all confidential of course it never gets out it never goes anywhere but you know do you want do you want someone that you're not totally comfortable with looking at those things? Well, that, that's a personal choice. So I always say, let's have a phone conversation first, or we can set up a, a teleconference um, if that helps some people. Uh, but let's get to know each other first because, you know, maybe I'm not comfortable. Maybe maybe it's not something that's, that's best for me. Maybe I'm not, maybe you're not the right client for me just because I may not be the right attorney for you. Um, so that's usually step one. Step two, I like to make sure that we're on the same understanding of what these things are, explaining what the documents are, explaining what your needs are um seeing if we missed anything along the way uh those kinds of things so it, it, phone is usually the best way and then after that we can communicate by email you know i'll draft documents i'll send for review say does this look does this encompass what you're looking to do do you have any questions that kind of stuff we can go back and forth that, that that's kind of the that's kind of the gist that we like to that we like to do that sounds that sounds great i mean uh especially those that are uh, for some reason, again, Star Wars, and I may not be. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but yeah, you, you you ask some very difficult questions of people to think about what they want to do in case they are in, you know, yeah. on uh, life support. What what do you want to happen to you? Yeah, I, I, questions to think about. I actually want to um, to to take a step back because uh, you know I talked about the financial power of attorney. Then the, the the medical director that we talked about, healthcare power of attorney, mm -hmm. um, who's going to make medical decisions for you in the event that you're, in, you know, you are, you cannot make medical decisions for yourself, a coma, under anesthesia, whatever an emergency arises, um, you know, that's one of those things also that if you don't have that thing in place that someone can make decisions for you and what those decisions may be, mm -hmm. um, that causes a, that's the one of the main things that causes a lot of hurt expense and time in a family um when we talk about the advanced healthcare healthcare directive i always point people to a case from years ago um that may be familiar with some people and that's the that's the case of terry shiva oh yes i remember that one it was from florida i think or, or like, I, think. I, I think it was in florida yeah. um i, I want to say it was because i think like jeb bush was the governor at the time and actually got to him and um all these stuff but this was um I don't, I don't remember specifically the circumstances about what happened to her. I think there was some sort of malpractice that happened because there was a malpractice lawsuit that happened. But Terry Schiavo was what they called in a persistent vegetative state uh, was the phrase that was used. So effectively, her body was alive, but they were saying she had no real brain function aside from the minimal things, breathing. Um, I mean, really breathing, looking around, that kind of, but there was no you know, cognitive ability going on. Um, so her husband said her wishes would not were, were to be to not be like this. Her family, her parents said, no, we want to keep her alive because there's always, we, we oh, have wow. hope that it could be reversed. That's a big conflict. And, right. So there was a conflict between husband and husband's parents-in-law, her you know, wife's parents, uh, Terry Shadow's parents. And they... And this was after the medical malpractice case, so I believe you know they got they had got money from a settlement or something like that, or you know Terry Shive and her husband got money from a settlement because of what happened to Terry. So um, this happened in I want to say mid nineties, let's say nineteen ninety five or something like that. I don't have it in front of me at the moment, but um, I, I want to say it was like early to mid nineties. Um, they litigated what should happen to her well into the two thousands. For years, this was litigated. Appeals and everything went on. And my understanding is, um, they they spent pretty much all the money in the uh, in this in the medical malpractice case. So there was there's almost no money left. Um, ultimately, the court said, uh, we think her wishes would have been that she would not have wanted to be kept in this position. So they said, 
we can move forward and you know you can move forward and and and, and um not keep her on licensing measures the you know the um effectively saying she would she would not have wanted to be kept in the state uh but that took years and probably hundreds of thousands of dollars in fighting and i don't know the status of you know this husband and the parents today but i mean to have that kind of fight over you know over a person mm -hmm. uh, i'm hard pressed to believe that things are just things were just okay after that like okay it was all done we're all set let's all go our, let's all be happy now we're all family i i i'm um th those kinds of lawsuits cause a lot of pain and agony to people and they don't talk for a long time if ever again after that and all the money they spent on it so again when we talk about these these documents we talk about what are you doing to other people the people in your lives by having that document she would have saved her family look maybe they would not have agreed right maybe the parents mm -hmm. would have said no 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 we don't want that to happen but if he's following her wishes you have a more definitive approach of look this is just the way it is you know is it, 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 it people may still not be happy about it but you can't there's less you can fight about and there's that, that would have been that would have saved a ton of money and time of suffering for the family didn't they win the, the malpractice suit they won so they received a lot of money i'm assuming from the mal. i can imagine yeah. how much money of this was wasted on the lawsuit and, if and that's exactly it um i i read something recently i i i can't remember where it was that i saw it, but i read something recently that said that like they that like if they got a few hundred thousand dollars in settlement or something like that and that the money it pretty much evaporated in this lawsuit like there's nothing left yes. so yeah. you're right so you know and and that's just that's just one side of it that's just husband and wife's money right uh terry shive on her husband's money because it's her malpractice suit mm -hmm. what did the parents spend you know they had they got their own attorneys i'm sure and there's litigation costs a lot of money and they fought this for a long time a lot of appeals and like i said it went on for what like a decade of uh, fighting and fighting and fighting and then finally a court ruled yes she, you can remove the life sustaining measures she would not have wanted that we have enough proof to say this is what she would have wanted so they ended up obviously they went with what the husband requested and regardless right right last i saw it was something like that the court ended up ruling in his favor um and she passed away shortly thereafter wow um, devastating yeah but i mean like how much bad feelings of money went into that decision which we can set that up in advance right you, you know for for you know, uh, estate planning is like is like insurance you do it and hopefully you never need to use these things yeah that's but in the event, yeah but in the event that you do the savings are tremendous that's really great well i just i really want to say um thank you so much for your time i if anybody found this uh, beneficial to you, please share the post. Uh, I'd love for other people to hear what Nima has to say or connect with him directly and ask him questions. Yeah. You know, uh, I'm assuming just a phone call is, is free. The, the initial call, there's no charge to connect with Nima. Yeah, so please, we don't charge for consultations. So, so especially these times, you never know what's going to happen. Uh, I, I urge anybody, especially in the frontline workers, if you are a health professional, or anybody that's in a, even in a grocery store, anything that's um, on the front lines, just reach out to NEMA and make sure that your affairs are in order. Yeah, it's better to be safe than sorry, and save people some, save your family pain and trouble and financial burden of it all. So um, I'm going to start to wrap it up. Uh, first of all, I just want to we we had a good amount of viewers. I just I'm so grateful for everybody that was on our first live and I'm looking forward to more lives. If anybody has a topic they would like me to do a live about, I'm happy to uh, to add that um, on the next video. So again, reach out to Nima, reach out to me if you have any questions. Thank you everyone. I'm gonna sign off. Nima, did you wanna say any closing remarks? <laughs> any closing uh, quotes? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I have no closing quote, but you know, Stella, thank you so much for asking me. Um, you know, uh, I I appreciate you know this is the, this is the first one you're running, and, and you asked me to be on your first episode. So I'm um, you know very honored that you asked me to do this, and especially given the circum uh, the current circumstances and um, just the trend of people not knowing people 
typically procrastinate estate planning. It's not a thing that people want to do. Um, you know, there are, people always find a way to get busy and not do it. So hopefully during this time, people kind of relook those things, especially given the importance of it. Uh, so thank you for giving me the ability to tell people, look, now is the time to start looking at things. If you didn't do it yesterday, do it today. You know, tomorrow could be too late. It doesn't hurt to have a phone call to discuss these things. Um, and you may not think that you need it, but you know, again, I go back to, you may not need it today, but maybe something, maybe things open up for you tomorrow and if things go well for you tomorrow, then what do you do, right? Then, then what happens if something happens to you the next day? And these are far off circumstances, but they happen because that's how we know that, you know, there's always litigation, there's always fights, there's always something. These circumstances have happened to people somewhere in the world. So we always prep for those worst case scenarios. And so people should really get on top of it. So thank you again for letting me uh, be on here. So Bernie said it was very informative and uh, bye Frank, I see that you have to go. So I'm just, he said, thank you very much to, to you Nima. So again, thank you everyone. We're gonna sign off and be well. See you next Friday. Bye everyone. <laughs>